seated when I think about it How can I not clap my hands and shout about it How can I stay silent when they talk about it Amen. Bless the Lord, everybody. Amen. Oh, come on, y'all. We're not talking about me. Bless the Lord, everybody. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I'm going to just say this because I don't plan on doing much talking today. I came with a praise for God. Amen. This yeah. week, the Lord was just opening my mind to some things, guys. Let me share with you guys. Blessing the Lord and worshiping the Lord is such a beautiful thing because it gives us an opportunity to experience what heaven will be like, what the end result will be. Worshiping God is an act of faith, amen. You know, this week I was kind of talking with God in my mind about some stuff, you know, some stuff that he has called me to do, some stuff that, you know, I want to see him do in other people's, you know, lives and different things of that sort. And a lot of God had to show me that a lot of times we're not able to worship and praise God or able to have faith in what he's going to do because we're busy looking at ourselves. We see our inadequacies. We see the things about us that don't match up. We see our lack of resources. We see all these things, and it makes it hard for us to worship God. It makes it hard for us to praise God. And he reminded me of this. Just like with Abraham, every promise that he's made to us is based on his own character. Y'all, y'all, y'all miss that. Y'all miss that. See, when he told Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of nations, he said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And so I just want to encourage someone this week that everything that God's promised to you, he swore upon his own name. Not your abilities, not your resources. As a matter of fact, the messed up parts of you, he factored those in as well. And he's still going to get the glory out of your life. Amen. So let's just praise God. Let's just give him a praise for what he's already going to do. And just based on who he is. Amen. You guys sing with us. First song we're going to sing is Chasing After You. Let's go, guys. Feel free to stand to your feet, wave your hand, worship the Lord, run across whatever you need to do so that God can understand that you're chasing after him and that you want his presence in your life. Amen. Chasing after you, no matter what I have to do, cause I need you more and more. I'm chasing after you, no matter what I have to do, cause I need you more and more. I'm chasing, I'm chasing after you, no matter what, no matter what I have to do, cause I more and more. more and more Who's chasing after God? I'm chasing, I'm chasing after, after you No matter what No matter I what I have to do Cause I need Cause you I need No matter what, no matter what I have to do, cause I need you more and more. more, 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 more. Say 
praising after you. I'm praising my way through. You gotta praise your way through something just to be close to you. is amazing. Yes. It continues to amaze me how God can continue to fool with us and deal with us no matter how sinful and wretched that we are. It's just so amazing that God loves us the way that he loves us. Yes. And sometimes that amazingness of that love just overwhelms my soul. So let's tell God how amazing we think it is that he fools around with us. It says it's so amazing. It's so amazing. Lord, your love for me, your love for me, and it's so amazing, it's so amazing, your sacrifice, your sacrifice for me, and for every blessing, for every blessing, given to me, given to me, and for every valley, for every valley, you use, you use to say. I don't deserve your love. Your tender mercy. If not for God's grace, if not for your grace, where would I be? That's simple enough to catch on with, right? Sing along with us this morning. Oh Lord, it's so amazing. You're so amazing. Oh Lord, your love for me. Talk to him personally. It's so amazing. It's so amazing. Your sacrifice, Your sacrifice for me. And for every blessing. For every blessing. You keep on giving to me. Give that to me. And Lord, for every valley. For Who sees the valley? You used to strengthen I don't deserve. I stand amazed at your strength. I stand 
week guys it reached out and grabbed me this week let it grab you today the lord's been chasing after us he's been pursuing us he's been wooing us he's been trying to draw us unto himself there's so much going on right now in the world so much that can cause fear it can cause panic it can cause doubt but the fact that we belong to god do you understand what that means the fact that we belong to god what Pastor Jackson was just telling us, we belong to God. And we're in his hands. Praise God. I've been captured by a love I can't explain. And now you have me and I'm forever changed. Lord, I've abandoned everything I've ever known. Lord, I surrender. My life is not my own. I belong to you. 
Somebody needs to say this to God for real. To say my life is not my own. To you I belong. To you I belong. I I give myself. I give myself. There's someone in this building. God's just been waiting on you to surrender. I said my life is not my own. To you. To you I belong. I give myself. I give myself. I give myself. To you. Say I belong, I belong to you. I belong, I belong oh, to you. I belong, I belong to you.
One more time, say, my life is not my own, God. To you I belong. I'm going to give myself, I'll give myself to you. Who, who's the, the prayer of their heart today? Said, my life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself, I give myself to you. Say my life is not my own. My life is not my own. To you I belong. To you I Say I give myself. I give myself. I give it all. Say my life is not my own. My life is not my own. To you I belong. To you I belong. I give myself. Give myself, oh, give myself, myself, give myself to you one last time. My life is not my own. My life is not my own. To you I belong. To you I belong. I give, I give myself. I give myself. Self to you. Amen. Why don't you pray with me, Father? We're grateful, Lord, that your spirit is here with us today. And we're thankful, the Lord, that you claim us as your own. And so, Father, as the word goes forth today, bless us, dear Father, to be drawn closer to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you take your Bibles, uh, your electronic devices, and if you would stand with me in honor of the word of God as we Turn our attention to 2 Samuel chapter 17. 2 Samuel chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, and we'll look at verse 23. 2 Samuel chapter 17. Verses 1 through 5, and then we'll look at verse 23. When you have it, say amen. Amen. I'll be reading and you're hearing from the New Living Translation. Now, Ahithophel urged Absalom, let me choose 12,000 men to start out after David tonight. I will catch up with him while he is weary and discouraged. He and his troops will panic and everyone will run away. Then I will kill only the king. And I will bring all the people back to you as a bride returns to her husband. After all, it is only one man's life that you seek. Then you will be at peace with all the people. This plan seemed good to Absalom and to all the elders of Israel. But then Absalom said, bring in Hushai the archite. Let's see what he thinks about this. And then as you skip down to verse 23, the Bible says, when Ahithophel realized that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey, went to his hometown, set his affairs in order, and hanged himself. He died there and was buried in the family tomb. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The word of God says, uh, grass withereth and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. We've seen a lot happen over these last few weeks. Uh, the tragic, I'll just call it like it is, murders. And then, this might seem a little insensitive, but it has context in kind, the murders of five officers. I don't take the deaths of the five officers lightly for our own head elder and someone I've known for a very long time, served in Memphis for 10 years, the Memphis Police Department, my father served in the sheriff's department and 
for a number of years with the FBI. I understand, I'm sympathetic to the tragedies. I am not a politician, but I will say I don't buy into the story of what happened or who killed the officers. I think that is a little suspect, but I'm not here to talk about that. But I would like to point out this. The officers' deaths were tragic. No wife, no mother, no child should have to see their loved ones taken in the way in which it happened. Reminds me of a couple of things. That reminds me of the terrible times that we live in. Uh, we do know that certainly Jesus is soon to come. But it reminds me of something that this country does not want to deal with, and that is the issue of race and racial bias. And my thinking is, if we, if the country does not do something about the injustices that happen, particularly to people of color, I am afraid that what happened to the officers is just the beginning. But what I'm here to tell you today is that oftentimes in the church, we like to take revenge out on one another. And so today, I, I want to talk to you today under the subject, bitterness bites. Bitterness bites. One day, two monks were walking through the countryside. And they were on their way to the village to help bring crops. As they walked, they spied an old woman sitting at the edge of the river. And she was upset because there was no one there to take her across the bridge. And she could not get across on her own. The first monk kindly offered and said to the lady, we will carry you across the river if you'd like. She thanked them with gratitude in her heart and she accepted their offer. So the two men, they joined hands, they lifted this old lady between them and they carried her across the river. When they got to the other side, they set her down and she went on her way. And after they had walked another mile or so, the second monk who began to complain said, look at my clothes. They are filthy from carrying this old woman across the river and my back hurts from lifting her. The first monk just smiled at him and nodded. And nodded. And a few miles up the road, the, the second monk griped again. My, my back is hurting me so badly, and it's all because we had to carry this silly old woman across the river. I can't go any further because of the pain. The first monk looked down at his partner, now lying on the ground, moaning in pain. He says to him, have you ever wondered why I'm not complaining? He said, there is a reason your back still hurts. I'll tell you the reason at the end of the story. You see, today I want to speak to you from the word of God about how insane being bitter is. And just so I'm clear you understand what I mean when I talk about bitterness, I'm saying that you are bitter when you have deep-seated ill will for another person. Bitterness is one of the most critical mental problems in a person's life. And when a Christian is bitter, there is a loss of close fellowship with the Lord. Bitterness causes loss of many of the blessings that God has reserved for his people. You need to understand that bitterness is a mental illness. And it triggers other sinful behaviors such as hatred and cruelty and antagonism and self-pity. And, and those with an unteachable spirit are bitter and vindictive and desires for revenge. Bitterness ruins relationships and causes people to sever ties with one another. The poor Robert Frost said it this way, if one by one we counted people out for the least sin, it wouldn't take us long to get so we had no one else left to live with. Wow. It's like 
an oxymoronic cherished grub. We cherish the things we like. We cherish our parents. We cherish our children. We cherish our spouses. But when you're bitter, when you have a grudge against someone, it's like a wound we grab to ourselves and hang on to. It's like somebody who breaks their arm. And see, when you break a, a, a part of your body, the signal of the healing process is that you have a cast on it. But those who are bitter, it's like the person who breaks their arm. They don't go for the healing process. They just walk around bragging about their broke arm. I would venture to say that people who cherish broken arms, people who carry grudges, they display their cherished rooms. And if you've ever had a cast on, you celebrate your healing process by signing the cast. You don't mind people touching the cast when you're in a healing process. But when you are bitter, you get mad when people touch your wounds. I would venture to say, and you would agree, that there is perhaps nothing God asks us to do uh, that is harder than forgiving the person who has deeply wounded you. Some even venture to say that we should learn to forgive and forget. Some say forgive and never forget. But what does forgiving and never forgetting look like? You see, I might be able to forgive a criminal for stealing from me, but that does not mean I'm going to ask him to keep a hold of my wallet. I can forgive someone for saying nasty things to me while they're under the influence of alcohol, but I won't invite that person into an atmosphere where drinking is encouraged because that wouldn't work well for me. You see, forgiveness is not synonymous for amnesia, nor does it necessarily mean instant gain trust. However, Forgiveness means that I will let go of the anger and the need for retaliation. Truth is, forgiveness and fighting bitterness is tough business, especially when you have been hurt. And I'm not talking about when folks come out to cut you off in traffic. I'm not talking about the rude cashier at McDonald's. Uh, that stuff we get over. I'm talking about the deep hurts the painful blows we take from people that we least expect it from, the blows from people we love and cherish. Now, stay with me as we enter the story. In the Psalms, we read a very personal reflection from King David about betrayal that nearly took his breath away. David said in Psalm 41.9, even my best friend, the one I trusted, the one I trusted completely, the one who shared my food, he has turned against me. David again said in Psalm 55, 12 through 14, it is not an enemy who taunts me. I could bear that. It is not my foes who so arrogantly insult me. I could have hidden from them. Instead, it is you, my equal, my companion and close friend, what good fellowship we once enjoyed as we walked together to the house of God. In these Psalms, David speaks of the betrayal of his closest friend and advisor. This man could be trusted. This man could be depended on. He spent many years with David at his side, giving great advice. The man's name was Ahithophel. Ahithophel's name means brother of folly, but his life was anything but that. He was David's most trusted advisor. He was known throughout the kingdom for his great wisdom. Now, I got a lot of text to go through because we got to put this story together because at the end, I don't want you to be bitter anymore. Because the truth of the matter is, some of y'all still hating on folks. You're still mad at your mama. You're still mad at your daddy. You're just still angry. And you come to church every week with lifting hands up bitter. Trying to pray. See, the, the object of praising God is to help you release that bitter. 
But some of us like to pretend like we in favor of God, but you won't even call your brother. Now follow me, this text will come on the screen. In 2 Samuel 16 through 23, the Bible says Absalom followed Ahithophel's advice just as David had done. For every word Ahithophel spoke seems as wise as though it came directly from the mouth of the Lord. You know, my, my late grandmother, uh, I, 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 love, I, I love that woman. I've seen her, Pastor Jackson, I've never seen her read anything else but the Bible. Every morning, she's got the word open. Every afternoon after work, she's got the word open. Every night before she goes to bed, she's reading the word. And so I had that type of grandmother, I don't care what your problem was, she knew the solution in the word. I don't care what situation you were in, she knew how to find it in the word. Uh, uh, Grandma, I'm feeling sad. Baby, go over here to this text. Come on, I'm confused, baby. All you got to do is read this text. This is what the word of the Lord says. She always applied the word. It was as if everything she said, everything she told us came directly from the mouth of God. This is Ahithophel to David. According to the psalm, David relied on no one more than he did Ahithophel. Ahithophel probably saved David from a lot of foolish choices. He helped David in times of battle and building the kingdom and expanding the borders of his kingdom. Uh, as the king's counselor, Ahithophel had a lot of status in the kingdom. Being the king's counselor granted him access to the king that no one else had because in those days, the short before the king meant death but Ahithophel had instant access. He didn't have to ask for permission. He showed up when he wanted to. Now, some of us have to have people to call us before they come over. Some of us got so much going on that if somebody show up at your house uninvited, they just might not get in. Anybody, anybody care to admit that they got a call before they come? Amen. I know you're out there. Amen. But, but how many of you have somebody in your life, I don't care what time of day it is, I don't care when it is, they can come when they want to unannounced. Yeah, that, that was a hit of fail. He could, he could come unannounced. But watch this now. Someone once said that it's better to make enemies than friends because having friends brings more trouble than having enemies. <laughs> and so watch this, these were really tough days for David. And what made it tough was that it wasn't just anybody trying to kill him for the throne. It was his own son, Absalom. And much of this was because of David's sin with Bathsheba that, uh, that tore his family apart. And when you look at 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, the Bible says this, after this, Amson bought a chariot and horses, and he hired 50 bodyguards to run ahead of him. He got up early every morning and went out to the city gate. When people brought a case to the king for judgment, Absalom would, be, uh, would ask where in Israel uh, are where they from, and they would tell him their tribe. Then Absalom would say, you've got a really strong case here. It's too bad the king doesn't have anyone here to hear it. I wish I were the judge. Then everyone could bring their case uh, to me for judgment. And then he says, and I would give them justice. When the people tried to bow before him, uh, he wouldn't let them. Instead, he took them by the hand and he kissed them. Here he is warning them. Winning their confidence. Uh, being a, a politician, if you will. And so after about four years of campaigning, David's own son Absalom, while kissing up to the people, undermined his father by showing himself to everyone. Then in 2 Samuel 15, verse 7, Absalom said that he was going back to Hebron to fulfill a vow he made to the Lord. He took that 20-mile journey uh, from Hebron to Jerusalem, uh, and when he arrived, he sent secret messages to the tribes of Israel, saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpets, then say, Absalom is king of Hebron. You see, Absalom went down to Hebron not to fulfill a vow to the Lord, but he went down to plan an overthrow of his own father. 
Now David's servants, they warned him what was happening. And here's what they told him in 2 Samuel 15, verses 13 and 14. The Bible says a messenger soon arrived in Jerusalem to tell David, all Israel has joined Absalom in a conspiracy against you. Then we must flee at once, David said, or it will be too late. Hurry if we get out of the city before Absalom arrives, before or both we and the city of Jerusalem will be spared from disaster. And if you continue to read, you will see that David fled. And in verse 30, we see that David went up to the Mount of Olives to weep. David loved the city of Jerusalem, but knew that the city would be hurt in battle. People ask, well, why did David flee? Why didn't he stay and fight? I suggest that one of the reasons why David leaves because he knows that this battle against, is against his own son uh, and it's a result of his sin and not confronting Anna, his son, who back in 2 Samuel 13 uh, raped David's daughter, Tamar. David was passive in disciplining his children. He did nothing about his daughter's rape and this angered him. Might I stop here and say, you need to discipline your children. Yeah. Now, don't get upset with Pastor Lee after I get to know you. As a matter of fact, no, I don't even get to know your children. If they're doing wrong, I'm calling it out. Don't mind me. I'm going to love them. I'm actually going to spoil them. Uh, but if I see them doing wrong, I'm going to call them out. And I give you permission to do the same with mine. We've got to discipline our children. But the second reason I believe David didn't stay and fight it's because David loved Absalom more than he loved anyone else. He wanted to spare his own son's life. And so uh, David's own son uh, was betraying him. But watch this now. Things now get worse. So far, Absalom has lined up uh, on, on the side of his army, and he's gotten all his mighty men together. Uh, their hearts would turn. Absalom needs an advisor to help him make decisions. And so in 2 Samuel 15 verse 12, the Bible says, while Absalom was offering sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel, one of his father's counselors who lived in Gilo. Soon many others joined Absalom and the spirit conspiracy gained momentum. And so Absalom, this rebellious son, he was far from stupid. He wanted a strong kingdom, and so he sent for the wisest man in Israel to be at his side. Now, Ahithophel was David's advisor. He spent years helping David make the kingdom great. David trusted no one more than Ahithophel to help him run the kingdom. So why was Ahithophel in Gilo with Absalom? Why was he not with David the king? When you read uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 31, uh, uh, the Bible says when someone told David, that his advisor Ahithophel was now back in Absalom, David prayed, Oh Lord, let Ahithophel give Absalom foolish advice. David recognized how serious this is. He knows that his son Absalom wanted him dead, and now Absalom, uh, who wants his father dead, now has the wisest man at that time at his side. There was no greater counsel than Ahithophel. David prayed the unusual prayer, make him stupid. Then David gets smart. He now sends for Hushai and try to, so, so he can infiltrate Absalom's circle. Now, when you fast forward to 2 Samuel chapter 16, starting with verse 15, here's what the word says. Absalom and all the army of Israel arrived at Jerusalem, accompanied by Ahithophel. When David's friend Hushai, uh, the ark had arrived, he went immediately to see Absalom. Long live the king, he exclaimed. Long live the king. Then Absalom, is this the way you treat your friend David, Absalom asked? Why aren't you with him? I'm here, Ahushai says, because I belong to the man who is chosen by the Lord and by all the men of Israel. Anyway, why should I serve you just as I was with your father, as your father's advisor? Now I would be your advisor. Then asked him, turned to Hitherfell and asked him, what should I do next? Hitherfell told him, go and sleep with your father's concubine. For he has left them there to look after the palace. Then all Israel would know that you have insulted your father beyond hopes of reconciliation. And they would throw their support towards you. So they set up a tent 
on the palace roof where everybody could see it, Absalom went in and slept with his father's concubine. And Absalom followed Ahithophel's advice just as David had done for every word that Ahithophel spoke seemed as though it had come directly from the mouth of God. Now Absalom has two counselors, Hushai and Ahithophel. But Ahithophel was the more trusted one. But listen to the advice Ahithophel gives to Absalom now. Remember that Ahithophel was David's closest friend and trusted advisor. The question of the day is, what in the world happened that would cause Ahithophel to draw with Absalom and give advice not only to go after King David to shame him, but to kill him? At the end of chapter 16, Ahithophel tells Absalom, go and defile his father's harem. This is a gross and despicable, despicable act. And in those days, uh, it, it, was, it was really wrong. It was especially egregious. And it, it meant that Absalom was asserting himself and saying that he now had the rights to everything his father owned. This was the ultimate slap in the face. You should take note again that David sinned with Bathsheba. God told David that this would happen, but God didn't tell him how it would happen. Neither did God tell him who would be involved. And after Absalom sleeps with his father's harem, he asked both Ahithophel and Hushai for advice on how to defeat David's army. Going back to the scripture reading, now Ahithophel urged Absalom in 2 Samuel 17. He says, let me choose 12,000 men. Let me choose. 12,000 men. Let me start out to fight David tonight. I will catch up with him while he is weary and discouraged. Anybody ever had a good friend betray you? He and his troops will panic and everyone will run away. Then I will kill only the king. And I will bring back all the people to you as a bride returns to her husband. After all, it's only one man's life that you seek. Then you will be at peace. This plan seemed good to Absalom and to all the elders of Israel. But then Absalom said, bring Hushai the archite. Let's see what he thinks about it. And I'm so glad that God listens to prayer. Because here it is that this foolish advice uh, they're going to listen to. Hear the bitterness in Ahithophel's voice. He said, I will go out and kill I would take these men. I would do this myself. He wasn't betraying David out of convenience. This was personal and premeditated. But when we look at the story, we see that God's hand is on David's life. Remember, David's prayer was that just this once, Absalom would ignore the advice of Hithophel gives. Absalom asked the most trusted advisor for his counsel about how to defeat his army or his father's army, but he also asked Hushai for advice. In 2 Samuel, we don't have to read it, Hushai, empowered by God, gives this advice. He advises that since Absalom was new at war and that David, his father, was a seasoned war vet, he said that if you set out to fight David, it will make you look weak and cause the people to turn against you. So he counseled him instead, go before the people. Recruit more in the army. Lead the battle yourself, Absalom. Well, we know the story, Absalom, listen. And if you read more into it, you'll know that this brought David time to build up his army. David was victorious. His son was killed. And in chapter 18 of 2 Samuel, we read David's sorrow over his son's death. But what happened to Ahithophel? 2 Samuel 17, 23 says, When Ahithophel realized that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey, went to his hometown, set his affairs in order, and he hung himself. You know, ain't nothing like getting caught. He died there and was buried in the family tomb. And so watch this now. He has betrayed the man he has worked with for years. He helps conspire against him. His protection was first with David. Now his alliance was with, uh, uh, with Absalom. 
But now that Absalom is dead, David now knows that his advisor sided with his son. And so Ahithophel says, I'm not facing the king, I'll just hang myself. But what happened that made Ahithophel so bitter that he would betray his close friend and the king? 2 Samuel chapter 23. Watch this. I want you to pay attention to this list of David's mighty men. 2 Samuel 23 verse 34. It should be on the screen. It says, Elephalet, son of Ahasbah, from Maaka. Elephalet, son of Ahasbah, from Maaka. Then it says, Eliam, son of Ahithophel from Gilo. Now I want you to pay attention to the fact that this says Eliam was the son of Ahithophel. Now keep this in mind as we go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Watch this. He sent someone, 2 Samuel 11, he sent someone to find out who she was, talking about Bathsheba, and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now let me put this all together for you. Bathsheba was Eliam's daughter. Eliam's father is Ahithophel, David's advisor. So this makes Bathsheba Ahithophel's granddaughter. Ahithophel served faithfully alongside David, supporting him, loving him. Ahithophel's own son had fought faithfully alongside David as one of his mighty men. That's why when David asked who Bathsheba was, the servant really said, don't you know whose daughter this is? Ahithophel, he is his closest friend and advisor. He helped David expand his kingdom. He was a military genius. And this is how you repay me? Imagine the hurt that Ahithophel feels. You did what to my granddaughter? You ruined her marriage. You killed my son-in-law. And to add insult to injury, because of David's sin with Bathsheba, Ahithophel's grandson dies. Then Solomon is born, and every time Ahithophel looks at Solomon, he's reminded of what David did to him. This is why he said, I, I'll get him back. This is why Ahithophel was not in Jerusalem. He went back home and spent years in bitterness, plotting his revenge. Then when Absalom summoned him, he said, I'm going to take advantage of this plan. He seized this opportunity. He told Absalom, no, you don't have to kill him. I'll take care of the rascal myself. You see, when God talks about forgiveness, he is addressing issues like this real hurts he's addressing that that deep-seated anger that you have for those that hurt you but what did this bitterness do it did not hurt David it hurt Absalom it hurt Absalom you know someone once said that harboring bitterness is like drinking poison but expecting somebody else to die You see, the story was told of a family who came down with this devastating illness. And some of the children died and the rest of the family suffered permanent brain damage. What investigators discovered was that the father had found a truckload of discarded corn seed and he fed it to the family halls. The corn, which was not intended for animal feed, had been treated with, some, uh, with something bugs or some type of pesticide uh, so that the bugs wouldn't eat it before it germinated. So the, they fed it to the hogs, the hogs ate it, and there was no effect. But when the family hogs became the family breakfast, the family was poisoned. 
It seems that many substances, the pesticides and the metals like lead and mercury, they do not pass through the digestive system, but they actually remain in the body in tiny doses. The effects are minimal, but over time, the effects are horrible. And that's what many of us are like. Every day we ingest minute amount of conflict and disrespect. No big deal, we, we just blow it off. Uh, but instead, what happens is that bitterness, it's, cancer, it's like a cancer. Uh, it gets buried in our liver and in our lives. And then 20 years later, we're sitting in a board meeting and can't wonder why we don't have control over our emotions. You see, remember the story we began with. The story of the two monks who, who carried the woman across the bridge. Uh, the, the second monk who kept complaining about his back because he was mad that he had to carry the woman. The first monk said, let me tell you why your back is hurting. He said, your back is hurting because while you put her down, you're still carrying her. Y'all will get that in a minute. That's what it's like when we deal with one another in our families. We're like that second monk who won't let go of the pain, who won't get or let go of the past, and we remind people every once in a while because we want to get the upper hand over them. We still carry burdens that we should let go of. When you won't let go of the hurt, that's when our lives become destroyed. That's when we have it. Is. It's not people that destroy you. It's the fact that we won't forgive. Jesus in his teachings on how to pray said to his disciples, when you pray, say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you don't, I will forgive your sins. So the question I have for you today, are you still bitter? Are you still angry over something somebody did to you? Remember what happened to Absalom. Remember what happened to Ahithophel. Their anger turned on them just because Ahithophel was mad at something David did that God forgave. And isn't it interesting that we ask God for forgiveness every single day, but we refuse to forgive one another. How long Will we not forgive? But the question really is, how do we forgive deep hurt? Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 says, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting men. Meaning, how do we fail the grace of God by being bitter, by letting, the hurt, uh, letting it hurt and, and poison and defile us? How do we forgive deep hurt? The apostle Paul says, get rid of all bitterness in Ephesians 4, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And here's the solution, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. How do we forgive deep hurt? The apostle Paul says in Romans 12, never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with one another. Never take revenge. Leave that to me, God says. I will take revenge. I will pay back. That's what the Lord says. Then he says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If they are thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, he says, you will be burning coals of shame on their heads. He says, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. How do I overcome deep hurt? The Bible says, then Peter came to him, Matthew 18, and said, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times. No, not seven but 70 times seven. And, 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 and let, me, let, me, let me back up in that chapter because we have a hard, can I be, we just have a hard time following the word of God. 
We make the word of God seem like it's, it's deep. It ain't deep, it's, it's simple. Here's the simple. Somebody offend you, go to them. How simple can it get? He says, if you win them over, praise God. If you don't, go get two or three more people. Bring them with you. And by the way, in case you think the two or three people are there to side with you, you're wrong. They don't come to side with you. They come in the spirit of reconciliation. Their purpose is not to uplift your mess, but to be a witness of the exchange. But the Bible says if that don't work, take it to the church. But that's not the part we have trouble with. Because we easy, we, we take stuff to the church. That's easy. Yeah, we go there first. That's, that's the easy part. But watch this now. The word of God says if none of that works, treat them like a public and a sinner. And most of us think that means white, white people off. <laughs> yeah. The text really tells you, after you go yourself, don't work. After you take two or three people, don't work. After you go before the church and don't work, do it again. In other words, there is never a time where we can write somebody off. There is never a time. How many times has God written you off? Never! You see nowhere in scripture where he writes off neither publican nor sinner, but he's always in the process of reconciling. And so God says, if step one does not work, step two does not work, step three does not work, do it again. It don't even matter if you never reconcile. Your position is, I'm the reconciler. And imagine if everybody was in the spirit of reconciliation. What would the church look like? Watch this now. How, how, how do I overcome this? Nike says just do it. There is no manual on forgiveness. There is no 12-step program. The only example we have is Jesus. Jesus, did Ahithophel have the right to be offended? Yes. Did David do a horrible thing? Yes. Did Ahithophel have the right to be angry? Yes. But did he have a right to carry out his grudge and bitterness? No. The best way for us to diffuse our bitterness and diffuse grudges is having the spirit of forgiveness. In fact, when you are offended, you ought to be in a position to forgive whether the person comes to you and asks for it or not. In fact, if you're going to be like Jesus, when we offend him, uh, he don't wait for us to come to him. Uh, he comes after us. And if you're going to be like Jesus, when you are offended, you ought to be like him and go after the offender. Yeah. Because here's the truth. If anybody had a right to harbor ill will towards anybody, it was Jesus. Yet while he hung on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, all of them. The Roman soldier, forgive them. The religious leaders, forgive them. The disciples who left him hanging, forgive them. You, forgive them, me. Forgive them because they don't even know what they're doing. Because the Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, yet with his stripes we are healed. And that's the thing that kept Jesus from being infected by those wounds was the fact that he loves us and that he cares for us. And the truth of the matter is, some of us need the presence of the Lord in our lives because the hurt is deep and God knows it. So here's what I'm calling as we close. 
Some of y'all still angry? You still mad? You still hurting? Whoever done hurt you done went on with their life. And you hanging yourself, still being mad. It's time to let it go. So you need prayer. I don't care, don't nobody. You don't be ashamed. You need to come down and bring your bitterness to the Lord. Bring your anger to him right now. So I'm calling you. You still hurting over something? Still mad? Person didn't apologize? You have trouble forgiving the God is calling you. Come on. Bring it to the Lord. Let him help you. I won't hold you long, because I, but I realize that some people just, they want to hang on to being angry just a little while longer because they feel like it's going to do them some good. But what if this is your opportunity to be free from your anger and you refuse? This was the last appeal to you to let it go. And God is saying, I'm, I'm going to give you freedom today. Don't want you to be angry anymore. Don't want you to be hurt. You want to come and have somebody pray with you so the Lord can start that process of forgiveness. You've got to make the first step. Father, we thank you because you show us in the word of God that you are aware of life situations. You, you understand the hurt and the pain that people have caused us. But Lord, you still say forgive. And so Lord, as those who are here have come asking for prayers, they Submit their wills to you, God, and Lord, believe in the Father. You will help them to get over the hurt and the pain that they're still experiencing, God. We believe by faith, Lord, that you're going to give them victory, dear God, over their bitterness, over their anger. But Lord, perhaps somebody is still sitting. They don't even realize their condition. I pray, God, that you have mercy, that you would, would, would woo them and bring them, Lord, to the point that where they're coming to you, God, asking you to forgive them for holding on to the bitterness and anger before it's too late. Because, Father, you said if, if we can't forgive the Father, you won't forgive. And, Lord, part of, our, part of our entrance into the kingdom deals with the issue of being able to let go of those hurts. And so, Father, we pray each and every person on the sound of my voice, their father, is able to reconcile, if possible, with their brother. But even if reconciliation is not possible to God, we pray that you would still give us the spirit of forgiveness. Help us, dear God, as we seek to live out your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, sing this song with me. I need you. Come on, sing together with me. You need me. I'm all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Stand with me. Agree with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. It is his will. It is his will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive.